For all you people out there that think you can't figure out the domain name industry or look for bargains or make sales because you have a day job and a family and a life, I say you're full of it. Today's guest works a full-time job and yet has grown his domain name investing side business to six figures. He is one of the hardest working people in our industry and we're going to learn how he balances everything and somehow gets it all to work. Stay tuned. Three messages before today's show. First, if you're a domain name investor, don't you have unique legal needs that require domain name technical know-how and industry experience? That's why you need David Westlow of Wiley Rhine. Go search for David Westlow on Domain Sherpa, watch his interviews, and you can see for yourself that he is intelligent and articulate, can help you with buy-sell agreements, deal with website content issues and UDRP actions, and can even help you write your website terms and conditions. David Westlow is the lawyer to call for all your internet and intellectual property needs. See for yourself at newmediaip.com. Second, when you have questions about domain names, where should you go to ask them? The answer is dnforum.com. Not only is DN Forum the largest domain name forum in the world, but it's the best. You can learn about domain names in the industry, buy and sell domain names, talk about domain name news, and meet other domainers just like yourself. Register for a free DN Forum account and begin advancing your skills and knowledge today. And when you do sign up, send me a friend request so we can connect. My ID is Domain Sherpa. Finally, whenever I'm thinking of buying or selling a domain name, the very first place I go is estabot.com. Their service provides quick and comprehensive information about the valuation and the critical factors that you need to know about, like other extensions that are reserved, recent sales, search volume, and cost per click rates on search engines. And if you haven't tried their lead generator service for domains you want to sell, you're missing one of the most powerful tools around. Those are the reasons I pay for the service every month. Here's your program. Hey everyone, my name is Michael Seiger and I'm the publisher of DomainSherpa.com, the website where you come to learn how to become a successful domain name investor directly from the experts. Lots of people think, I can't do domain name investing because I have a day job. I want to, but I can't quit my job to do domain name investing full time. It's easy to make all the excuses and not pursue domain name investing, but today's guest is going to kill that myth. And we're going to find out exactly how he does it. I'd like to welcome to the show Shane Cultra, best known as Domain Shane from DomainShane.com and best known to his mom as probably Terrence. Shane, welcome to the show. All right. Thanks for having me. All right, Finally. Did your, mom, did your mom call you Terrence or did she call no, you Shane? My mom calls me Shane. My, dad, <laughs> my dad's name is, is Terry. So we always go to the middle name. So you'll see a lot of people in my family that have the same names, but none of us use the same names. Yeah, exactly. And so we're going to dive into why everybody in your family seems to have a lot of the same names. It's a great story mm -hmm. and one that I, I found in the research. Um, so I want to start off and I, and I want to hear the whole story, Shane. I want to go back in time and figure out what you did out of high school and get in how you found domain names and how you've built it to a six figure while working a day job. But I first like to start with sort of the end in mind. And in this interview, the end is um, tomorrow, April 15th, tax day in the United States. Taxes are due and I'm sure you've completed your tax returns, right? I, I did them literally. My wife took the last couple digits and threw, yeah, hours ago, hours ago. <laughs> Nice. And of course, with tax day, you got to figure out where everything stands. How did I do last year? Did I make money? Did I lose money? I said in the introduction that um, that your uh, um, domain name uh, business was a certain amount. What was your 2012 domain name investing uh, revenue? It was just just over a hundred thousand. It it it. You know, as, as my whole life, there's so many different forms of income and between my accountant and my wife kind of helps me gather up stuff, they just all shake their heads. I mean, there's just so many different sources and the, you know, the nursery industry and we'll, we'll go into deeper details, but she couldn't believe when she was adding it up just saying, really? You know, she sees me working 
but it, I kind of keep the money separate. We, we keep nursery money as a family, but the domain goes into a separate kitty. And so it's really the first time she gets to see it and really kind of the first time I get to see it. And uh, it's impressive. And all I can think about is I need to buy myself something because, you know, I work so hard. I never yeah. buy, never spend any of it. I don't spend $500 on anything other than with my domain money. So that's the first thing that came to mind is I really need to buy something. Totally. Okay. So, and, and as everybody can see, you are in your nursery. We're going to understand what that nursery is and where it's located so people can come down and see Domain Shane in person because you're not just one of the guys that works on Wall Street. You're in the nursery every single day. Seven days a week. This time I work 80, 90 hours a week in the nursery, not even counting domains. I work, I'll work the next eight weeks without missing a day. Wow. And and so, you know, when you and I were going back and forth this week trying to pick a date, you were uh, central time in Illinois and I was uh, uh, Pacific time in Seattle when we were going and saying, well, what about like late afternoon? You're like, I work. Well, what about early in the morning? I work. <laughs> and so yeah. I appreciate you staying late after work and recording it from the shop so people can see the nur at least the, the office of the nursery. And, uh, and thanks for taking time out of the busiest, one of the busiest uh, uh, portions of the year for you. Absolutely. Um, okay, so you're, you filled out your taxes, six figures. Do you know how many transactions that was for 2012? You mean as far as domain sales? Yeah. Uh, it was probably in the 30s to 40, if high 30s as far as domain transactions. Now, and I, and I take that back. There were some smaller ones. I do sell through Namejet, so I'm a private seller through there. Uh, they were sm there were some smaller ones mixed in there because I do flip domains, maybe buy them at one location and sell them at another. I kind of, I don't, I mean, they count, of course, they sure. add up, but uh, the bigger ones tend to, tend to be the, you know, the ones that I, I really cherish that yeah. I'm going at. Now, is um, just because people are going to say, well, was it six figures in revenue or was it six figures in profit? You know, was it six figures in total sales or was it six figures in profit, Shane? And, and it probably, yeah, it, it'd be in, well, I declared pro revenue and, and profit dollars. So, yeah, I mean, of course, taxes are a little complicated, but, but yeah, after, after the purchase of the domain or after the cost of the domain, it was just over six figures. Mm. It might have been a couple thousand shy, but it, it was there. And of course, I do, you know, in those numbers I'm counting, there is revenue from the blog and I, and right. I have uh, some other, you know, generating websites, you know, little numbers there. But altogether, that's what it came out to be. And it, I consider that all domain related. It's all based on domains generating that. Cool. And so the, the audience is listening. We've got some small hiccups now and again. Hopefully when, when I go to produce this thing, it'll all work out. But if there's ever a portion, Shane, where you don't hear me or I don't hear you and it's uh, critical to the story, I'll just ask you to repeat it. I'm sorry about the... Oh, oh no, that's religious. okay. That was, that was somebody texting me on my, my <laughs> computer. So, And that's the one thing about living in central Illinois is, you know, I, I, I talk to people and, and they're getting high bandwidth. Like when you were telling me yours, I'm thinking, do you live in South Korea? I mean, yeah, <laughs> really good. Out here, I'm still, I'm still at five. And I could... I could buck up for more, but my house is chaos right now, so I came out to the nursery. <laughs> I hear you. No worries. All right. And so um, looking back at 2012, do you remember your best sale? Like what was the one domain that you just remember as being, you know, that was a killer domain? Yeah, I had, I had uh, and it, it, this one was private, but it was two awesome letter uh, dot org. It was uh, a you know a good letter, goodletter.org, and it was five figures. And I had just purchased it and flipped it pretty quickly, so I was I was pretty happy with that one. Wow. Hey, it looks like my camera has frozen up. Do you see it frozen, Shane? Yeah, but that's okay. We don't have to see your I'm face. I'm smiling at least, right? I, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I can hear you just fine. So if you're, cool. I'm gonna stop my video and turn it back on here. I'm gonna make you look at me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it was a it was a letter letter dot org, sort of like md dot org that just sold for five hundred and fifty five thousand on Namejet a couple days ago. I'd like to claim that one, but that wasn't that wasn't. All right, great sale. All right, so let's go back in time, Shane. I love to do research on my guests. One of my favorite sources of LinkedIn of uh, is LinkedIn dot com, um, where I viewed your profile, and I gotta say, my favorite part of your profile is the <laughs> honors and awards section. And the first yeah. entry was Classic Domain Shane. The title was Third Place Optimist Club Layup Competition 1977. And the oh. description read, 
deserved first, but pretty sure parent lost count due to my amazingly quick layups. <laughs> <laughs> it was, and that's a true story. It was a Wendy's basketball shootout, and they said, make as many baskets as you can. And everybody else shot from the free throw line. And I just walked up to the underneath and started doing layups. And they decided that they would count a third of them and put me in third place. And I've never forgotten that. So, But there's a couple. I mean, there were, those are the things I remember. And I came home saying, I, I know I won this thing, but they gave me third place. And I still have all the trophies. They sit on my office desk at home. You were so ripped, you were man. There was up. no rules about not doing layups. That's exactly right. And that's how I operate. You know, if if it's not laid out, then I'm going to explore the options. And I, <laughs> it started young, real young. I love that. So we're going to get into the domain name industry, and we're going to figure out what those – what those, if people don't define the rules, what are those areas that you look at where there is opportunity to be had? But I, I think that's a great example of not only your wit that I love from reading domainshane.com, but it also shows your attitude towards doing things. So that's, you know, it's pretty phenomenal. And do you remember, um, do you remember who got first place and second place? Do you still like yeah. razz them? I, like you, I, 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 I don't that trophy. I tell you one thing I do remember from that story is I had to raise money. So I got a certain amount of, of dollars. You know, you go to door to door and say, however many shots I make, you're going to give me money. And people were giving me, and this is back in the 70s, 50s and a dollar per shot, thinking right. it was free throws. <laughs> so I just remember going back with, I think it was in the 50s and thinking, I have to go ask this woman for $56 and she's expecting to give me three or four. So I kind of I didn't raise quite as much as I had pledged yeah. on that one, but I don't remember who was first and second. But I still, like I said, I still have the trophy, and it was, uh, you know, it was one of those things I did real well, and my parents still laugh about. That's awesome. All right, so let's fast forward on your resume a little bit at LinkedIn. I saw that you went to the University of Alabama. Uh, for anybody that knows me or or uh, listened to the Jesse Stein interview that I did uh, uh, with Jesse about sportsmemorabilia.com, you'll know that. I'm a UC Santa Barbara grad, Gauchos, my alma mater. Um, I know people that were, you know, on the five-year plan, uh, heck, on the six-year or seven-year plans. But on your resume, you you show that you're going to Bama from 1987 to 2001. Are those dates correct? What does it say? 87 to two? Oh, that's because I graduated in 91. It didn't take me. <laughs> <laughs> Four and a half year program, but not fourteen. Oh, and a half. Okay, it was you know, a four and a half. There's a typo Alabama on there. Math, I that's thought that was going to be another story, and I could, if anybody was going to have a story like <laughs> that, it was going to be you. Oh no, no, it didn't take me quite that long. But yeah, yeah, I didn't even check that. You know, honestly, <laughs> LinkedIn. That's all pretty recent. I just now got more involved in LinkedIn, but first person to point that out. Nice. All right. So you graduated from college and you began working in the nursery business right out of college. Is that right? No, actually, what happened in, you know, I'm a fifth generation nurseryman. So I'm the fifth generation to come into the business. And every single generation didn't want to go into your family business. You work right. in it, doing it the whole time. And you just say, I'm not going to do this. I don't want to go into that. So I'm the for I'm fortunate to be the first generation not to come home from war. First was Civil War, then World War One, then World War Two, then Vietnam. And, and I didn't have to face that. But I still wasn't going to go. I met a trading instructor in college who was my teacher who got me involved in trading. And I got a job right out of college at the Chicago Board of Trade. Oh, wow. So I moved from Alabama to Chicago and moved downtown and trading. And I traded there for a couple years, clerking and assisted. And then I got to trade. And long story short, I, I wasn't real good at it. I mean, I, I could... I can make money, but the splits were really bad. I don't know if anybody's familiar with trading. You have to give up 80% uh, of your income for your financier. They give you money, you trade, mm -hmm. you make 100000 they keep 80 you keep 20 you have to pay your seat, you have to pay your expenses, you, and you get to keep it. And it just wasn't good. I made a lot of money and, and took home nothing. Yeah. And I always said when I made enough to buy my own seat that I would come back and do it myself. But long story short, it wasn't working out. I talked to my dad, and my dad said, hey, you're always welcome to come back to the nursery. We got a new new location, and I'd love to have you back, and that was 19 years ago. Wow, 19 years. So, um, so yeah, tell me about this five generations of nurserymen. The very first person in your family to start a nursery started it right, after, right out of the Civil War. Is that correct? 1865, came home from the Civil War, and at the time, you know, every— 
this is part about business. You, you sell what people need. And in 1865, people needed food. So he sold apple trees and berry plants door to door. And, and he really was one of the first true Johnny Appleseeds. Yeah. And that's, that's how it started. Then he started planting more. And every generation has grown plants that that particular point in society needed. We're more into perennials and flowers and baskets at this point in time. But we still, you know, grow your own fruit is back again. We're doing a lot of that. So that's how it all started. Yeah. And, and so I've known that you were in the nursery business um, but you know, everybody sort of has their own idea about the nursery business. Like for me, I live on Bainbridge Island right outside Seattle. And if I drive two miles North, there's a nursery up there. It's probably on five, 10 acres. It's relatively big, but in terms of nurseries, I, you know, it, it's big, but it's not really big. Your nursery is actually pretty good size, isn't it? Yeah, I'd say we're middle ground. Uh, I know lots of friends that own nurseries that are 1,000 acres and 500 acres. We have three locations. We have a 50-acre location, 48 officially, and then we have another location that's 60 acres and then a third location that's seven acres. Yeah, so, so it's medium big, but you can do yeah. millions and millions of dollars on that size property. Right, and you have like hundreds of thousands of square feet of greenhouses where you grow things all year round and then you're bringing them out and you're selling them and you've got a retail division like like I can see right behind you yeah. you've got a wholesale division yeah you've got we, a landscaping all, division just like I said earlier we're always exploring ways to sell things our 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 job is to produce a product and that's plants and then the next job is to figure out how to sell them and all the things you mentioned are great ways to sell them as long as you're producing the product boy retail i skip all the middle people from seedling to finish that's how you make money no yeah. middle guy so, so your seedlings basically cost you a few pennies a piece wouldn't it be great if you could buy your domain names for a few pennies a piece sit well, on them for a couple of years and then sell them for uh there are some guys in this industry that have yeah <laughs> yeah but there's maintenance costs just like domains you know you're going to hear me do a, a lot of analogies to plants and you see it on the on domain chain it's just Time is what grows things, and it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time, but you can start with something small, and if you're patient, it turns into something big. And, and I learned that in the industry, nursery industry better than anything. All right, I'm going to come back and ask you about time and patience and how that led to sales in 2012. Uh, but before we go there, I can see right behind you, Country Arbors Nursery is the name of your nursery. Where is that located? This one's in Urbana, Illinois. We actually are about a mile and a half, two miles outside of the University of Illinois. I live on a college town. That's, mm -hmm. I always promised myself once I went to Alabama that I would always live in a college town. And I do. And it's, it is just off campus. It's right outside of town. And the nice thing is we bought the land super cheap. And the land just set record prices next door to us at 15000 an acre. Wow. So we paid 20th or 15th of that. So nice. That, that alone is, is a nice thing to have. But yeah, we're in Urbana, Illinois. Our other location is in a small town of Onarga. If you read our history, that's where it all started, in Onarga. Uh -huh. And then we bought new land in Charleston, Illinois, which is the home of uh, Eastern Illinois. So another college town. So that's where I want to be, college towns. So if people want to come out and they, they live in the area and they want to do buy some uh, uh, plants and get some advice and figure out how to you know, get their soil rich I, and they want to come to Domain Shane, where do they go to see you uh, in action? You'll see them in the contact. Like Adam Strong, for instance, today, <laughs> or no, yesterday, sent me a picture of a fungus on his oak tree. <laughs> you know, it's not It's it's not even about domains. He sent me that. Or Aaron Wilkin from uh, Accidental Domainer. He lives in Colorado, rode his bike from Colorado to here said hello, and then went to see his family who lives <laughs> just north. That's so it's hilarious. What makes us together is, you know, all this domain and plants. It's We all, we may not all do domains, but we all have something to do with plants for the most part. That is true. That is true. All right, so you're based in Ar Urbana. So if people Urbana. want to come see you, Champ go to... Go Champaign-Urbana. To yeah. Champaign-Urbana, okay. Of course, um, he's on Champaign-Urbana. I'm on Champaign-Urbana.com. I own the tenth <laughs> name. <laughs> All right, tell me about being on TV. You were on PBS for over 10 years. Yeah, I've been um, I've been on a show called Illinois Gardener since 1996. And uh, it's every Thursday night. It's the most lo it's the most popular locally produced show other than the morning news, morning and evening no news. Uh -huh. And it used to be on 
just Thursdays, and now it's syndicated to a hundred stations across the Midwest. Uh -huh. So it's it's pretty, you know, it's very laid back. It's very very Saturday Night Live skittish. You know, it's, <laughs> some people would use the word hokey, but when it comes to ask, uh, asking questions about plants and answering it, uh, it's it's a great show, and it's really good for me as far as learning to talk in front of a camera and being on the news, and and so I've kind of. I, I talk all the time. I give about 30 talks a year. I have no problem being in front of a camera, in front of people. As long as you're talking about what you know about, right. it's a piece of cake. And that's how this show is. It's unscripted. It's questions. And it, it, again, as long as you're telling the truth, using knowledge you have, television is a piece of cake. That's so. awesome. So do you get do you get um, groupies coming in, some, uh, some old women coming I, in I, like, hey, Shane, I saw you on it, Thursday. Oh. I, I'll go to Meyer, the supermarket, and I, I literally have to just answer question after question. <laughs> Every everywhere I go, that's what I'm the plant guy in this town. I'm I have radio commercials and TV commercials, so my voice is pretty distinct. It's a little Woody Harrelson, so they they won't know what I look like, but from the radios they'll go, Ah, you're Shane. Hey, can I ask you about a bush I have a problem with? <laughs> I get that all the time. And it's okay normally, but when I'm tired, I'm kind of ready to go home and not talk plants. Oh, totally. I, I can understand that. All right. So you've been in the family business for 19 years, five generations of nursery men, um, uh, many of which were named Terrence. Yeah. Well, my uh, here's, how, here's the confusing part. My uncle's name is Shane Culture with no other names in it. My dad's name is Patrick Terrence, and my name is Terrence Shane. So between all that Terrence and all that Shane, nobody can quite figure out who's who. Right. a birthday. Well, and there's other Terrences back up down back up the family tree. Yeah, there, there's other there's other names. Yeah, I mean, again, we tend to share names, and and I notice the new generation is starting to add some of the old names, the yeah. Spencers and all the old fashioned names. Yeah. We don't have a lot of Keegan, Kylan, Cogan, the new fancy names. They're kind of. Irish names is what they tend to be, is mm -hmm. Irish Scottish names. But we all spell them different. That's the other thing. If my dad spells Terrence different than I spell Terrence, and uh. Uh, but it is confusing, especially with my uncle and I going both by Shane Culture. I'm sure if you Googled me for a little research, you saw a little older guy in the pictures. <laughs> all right. So 19 years in the family business, and uh, two years before that, you were doing trading on uh, on the Chicago board. When did you first discover domain names? It was probably in really about that time, 95 and 96, I was still trading stocks. And, and I started noticing the domain names, but the problem with me, and this is a problem with everybody in life, is you see something that you know you'd like to do, but you, you just don't have the money. The renewal fees were quite high. Um, I'm not sure that I would have bought the right names, but I was definitely interested. I, I bought a couple, and this is people ask me this all the time. I can't remember the names I bought, but they were brandable, funny names, me trying to be funny, really no generics whatsoever. And, and there wasn't generics probably for the next 10 years. I probably didn't understand true generics and other ones all the way until 2007. I would say for 12 years, I wasted, I shouldn't say wasted my time, but I definitely wasted my money uh, mm -hmm. and I didn't take advantage of it, but it doesn't matter. I, I, I don't look back at it all and kick myself one bit because there's a million things in life that you coulda, woulda, shouldas, and that's just how life goes. Opportunity always presents itself when you don't have the cash and you have the cash and can't find the opportunity. <laughs> Someday they'll meet if you work hard enough. But. Exactly. So in 2007, after about 10 years, you, you finally figured it out. And what did you figure out? Well, honestly, there was a blog by Reese, and I don't know Reese's name, but it was LLL.com, 4Ls, or yeah, 4Ls.com, and he started pricing domains like commodities and picking what value letters had and what 4Letter.coms were selling for, and I realized that if I could target a certain niche and come up with a defined value, I had an ability to perhaps make some revenue of which would look me make me start realizing or start investing in some names that were generics because that's generics seemed to be selling high but I couldn't afford them mm -hmm. still then even in 2007 when they were cheaper I couldn't sure. and um, and I so I started reading his blog and long story short I the names I could afford that were generics were plant names nobody cared about plant names and still to this day a lot of people don't care about certain plants but I had enough money to spend a thousand or five hundred or fifty on plant names and so that was my first taste 
of generics. Mm -hmm. and, it, it, and that was where it started. So in 2007, you figured out that there were commodities that, that could be you know, bought and sold at a re relatively well-defined uh, uh, yeah. uh, value. value. Yeah. Uh, value range, uh, but you also understood that generics have value and you were going to stick to what you know, which is plants. And so you started buying generic plants. Like what kind of generic plant domains would you buy? I bought coleus.com. Coleus is one of our best selling foliage annuals here. Uh, and I bought uh, coneflower. Coneflower is another one that's one of our best ones. Mm -hmm. I bought ehort.com. It, you know, it, again, it sounds like a good name. E, like horticulturist. E, yeah, E H O R T. Uh -huh. I bought, um, oh, like plantsteaks.com and just things that we, you know, things I that you use every day. If I look behind you, I could probably Turn see out. all of those products. That's how I do it. I go to trade shows. I'd go here. I went to a trade show and they had this new apple tree. It had. It was single stem, maybe three feet wide, and it would only get eight or ten feet tall. And I said, what do you call it? He said, it's a pole apple. First thing I did is go and go buy pole apple and, and, you know, and, and register those names. So I, I listened or, and listened to my industry and started with that. And, that's, that's the, and I still hold all those. I've never sold a plant name or never a plant. Never sold. Have you been, have you been offered uh, in, money offered for a plant quite name? quite a bit. And I take that back. I sold boxwood.com. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, and I had I had purchased that, and it was sold to. You'd have to look, but it was it was most likely a. It wasn't box a plant person. It was probably a communications company oh, or something. Yeah. I can't remember, but I did sell that one off because I think shippable. And what am I going to do with that name? Is it going to be an informational site? Is it going to be something I, a product I can ship? And uh, and I needed the money at the time. It worked <laughs> out. And so, are you hand registering most of the domain names? Like to get boxwood.com, do you have to buy that off of no, somebody? Well, I think I paid. I think I paid four or five thousand for that, and then I sold it. I think close to five figures on on that one. Um, no, I, I do pay pretty good money. There are some that I don't think I've hand registered, but maybe thirty names. But some of them I don't have to pay very much. Like foliage plants. Foliage plants is a big name in our industry, especially down in Florida. And I think I paid seventy dollars on Namejet for it. Hmm. it. It's it's a big category killer for us. Yeah, but nobody cared about it. And I was right. I was ecstatic to have it. <laughs> So. Nice. Um, okay, and so you started buying a lot of these domain names. You weren't building out your own websites to try and bring more business to to your website because you don't really sell anything online, right? No, that's at this point we don't. Uh, that was the key to trying to do it. So I set up, in, and they're not that great, but they're informational websites. I take pictures here at work. I do what I do already, right. but I put them on the website, and now we rank first or second page for a lot of terms on Google. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, we're going to pull the trigger, as we keep saying. We'll pull the trigger and start selling online. But, you know, one fish, just this retail alone is hard to keep up. Mm -hmm. If I were to add another division, I, you know, I want to make sure I do something well before I go to the next level. And, yeah. and this nursery is still growing very quickly. I added eight new employees. We have 30-something employees here. And uh, it's kind of hard to add. I will do that. And it's very soon but one step at a time yeah definitely so right now you're just building sort of sites on stuff. those to get them with real content to get them ranked in google and showing up high and then at some point in the future when you're ready to go online retail then that's what you'll use yeah. those for and you'll pull them together i want to then. rank first page for all those plants all those terms yeah that's then great. I'll pull that trigger and then lead them to a main website and sell that product so you've got your own little niche around nurseries that you have over on the side but you're not it doesn't sound like you're monetizing them with Google AdWords. It might be three, three to four thousand dollars a year in Google. Yeah, that's about it. Okay. Yeah, so still, like I'm sure nobody would turn away three to four thousand dollars a year in Google. Uh, so that's decent. If I put a little time into it. It probably could be fifteen or twenty, but yeah. I just have. But that's not a hundred thousand dollars. So you no. you've got this other piece over here of domain name investing, where you're yeah. trying to buy low and sell high. Yes. And what do you focus on? Do you do you have any? Any areas that you'd just love to have, like technology? I, I, am or? The, I love liquid domains. And you'll hear that term on my website all the time. It's the ones that I know that if I come to you today and I give you a sheet of a thousand names, what are the first ones you're going to go to? What are you, what are you going to want to buy? And, and I've used other people who have sold portfolios. In the industry, a lot of people behind the scenes, if they're 
somebody's going out of business or somebody needs to sell a bunch, so they might pass some list around and say, "Are you interested in these names?" Right. Well, I'm pretty deep on that list. I, I, you know, I, in the domain industry, I'm a middle tier guy, I think. So it goes to all the big guys and it comes back to me. And the ones that are always gone, three-letter.com, four-letter.com, short name, two-letter.org, you know, all these little short names, five-letter.coms even. And, and so that tells me that those are resaleable. And those are the names that I concentrate on. If I know that I can buy it today and sell it tomorrow, and get somebody to pay it. Not have to call 500 people, mm -hmm. not have to send out a letter, but put it on Namejet or call somebody up, I can move it immediately. That's a name I want to start with at least. So it sounds like you're looking for bargains, you're buying them where you think there's value, and then you're just turning around and flipping them directly to other investors. You're not Absolutely. going. You're not going end user retail. You're going I've, just to make some money. I've never, I, I shouldn't say that. I've probably sent out three end user letters in my life. And and fairly good success, but but I sold uh, I sold Hortica H O R T I C A it was a name I bought. I thought it was a great plant name. Yeah. A great turned out to be a major horticultural insurance. And so I did approach them and say, Hey, if you'd like to buy it, I have it for sale. And we and we had, we stuck a pretty good price on that. I'm sorry, you and broke up for just a second there. You said it was a major uh, horticultural insurance company. Insurance. They, they, okay. They and so that was their trademark. Yeah, that Did was. Did that worry you? Yeah, but and this is the thing about it. There's so many terms in our industry that are trademarked. Hortica, you know, I, you know, honestly, if they were to fight it, they probably could. But I had it a long time, mm. and I was using it as a as an encyclopedia of plants, which is a great name, Hortica, yeah. for that. So, it, I know trademarks are important, and you can defend a lot of them. But in our industry, if I own Green Leaf, there's a lot of Green Leafs in our industry. There's mm -hmm. probably five companies called Green Leaf. So, is it a trademark officially? Yes, but the, as long as you're doing something different. Uh, and there's two green leaf plant sales. There's two nurseries mm -hmm. called. Oh, I'm sure there's more than two. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, those are the kind of things. Yeah. Sure. With a fine line. But you, we know what we're talking. We're talking trademark infringement and cyber squatting. Right. That's when you're trying to make money using their brand. Right. Riding their coattails. And that's not that's not how I was approaching it. So Yeah, no, definitely. So how many domains in whole would you say that you have that are plant related and how many you have right now in your portfolio that are investing related that you'd flip tomorrow if you got the right price? So, so I try and keep a, a certain number at all points in time. I try and keep around 300 uh, domains, 350 domains in my portfolio, about 200 of them which I am trying to flip at all points in time. Some I'm actively trying to flip, other ones I'm just waiting for mm -hmm. that time, that point in time. Um, but I always try and keep in that, that 300. 350 range and I will say there are so many people that track I do not keep them all under the same email address some of them under companies that I will, I never mentioned because I don't need I don't want everybody watching my every move um, I don't use privacy on anything uh -huh. but I do put them in areas that they they can't track every single move but I keep most of them under my name and if you, you want to keep see, people guessing man that's that's the way yeah, you well, I just yeah I don't want anybody following my exact strategy I hear you all right yeah. So liquid domains is what you're focusing on to, to make your yeah. dollars, um, to make your, your 100,000 plus in, in 2012, 3L, so LLL.com, 4L, 5L, short domains, Numeric, double L.org. Numerics, four number, numerics. Oh, I you love your numbers also. You talk about numbers a lot on your, on your uh, um, yeah. daily recaps. I love numbers because nobody – Nobody got numbers. I love things that are actively selling that people still don't think are valuable. I mean, I work with 4.cn. They were the first people that I really noticed selling a lot of numeric domains. And I love 4.cn because nobody can read it. Nobody can understand. I love <laughs> barriers to entry are a key to my existence. I it's to be more difficult. I don't want everybody in it. And Chinese language is a beautiful barrier. So how do and, you list your domains? Like, And I see them list – You know, I, I see certain um – so for anybody that isn't familiar with Domain Shane, if you want to follow Shane's recap of what's going on in, in the upcoming day. So today Shane posted Sunday's best uh, auctions going on. And so he might list um, 1278.com uh, and Shane may say 
this one's already got five bids and it's way over my budget so here it is go for it and it could be like at a thousand dollars and i look at stuff like that and i say that's crazy why is somebody paying that much money for four numbers that make no sense to me at all like i'm one of those people you're talking about yeah i mean we, i could have a whole talk on that but but the reality is in china and in asia that that is a name that's a brand that they want something that you can easily type in it doesn't matter what it is. As long as you can remember it, they get it. Here in America, we're trying to be crafty and all these hacks. But the reality is all I want to do is have you remember that name so you come visit me. They yeah. get that. And you can remember 1234 or 876. But they have a little, uh, a little superstition. They don't like fours because right. it represents death. And, and eight, is, uh, eight means fa, 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 which is good luck to you. So they love things that end in eight. But, you know, then I'm trying to explain eight in the middle is not, not as good as eight on the end or eight in the beginning. And there's all little rules that they play by. But the, but the end result is numerics were doing very well overseas. So I could buy them from the United States and then go over to China and sell them on 4.cn. It so kind of has changed now, though. Do you have a Chinese person that, uh, that or somebody that speaks Chinese working for you that gets on to 4.cn and no, can tell I, you, like, I, how to post them? Like, how do you, how do you figure CN it out? Is, 4.cn has been pretty nice about it. Um, they, they have an English-speaking person that helps me. Oh, and really, God. I've probably done more lately off of 4.cn. I still promote them, but the prices have actually gotten quite high now. So it's... Uh, it's getting tougher to flip. Even Namejet, you used to be able to buy them fairly cheap on Namejet. Yeah. Those prices are going for a lot too. So it's it's a little tighter market and it's it started to, there's no easy money in it now. And so I've kind of moved on to a different realm. Ah, yeah. All right. So I, I understand your liquid domains and what's your strategy around finding undervalued liquid domains? Do you just is it just a numbers game? You've got to look through 10,000 domains to find, you know, 10 good domains that are undervalued that you think you can buy low and, and sell for higher? Actually, the key. So I do my domain list every day and people kind of make fun of me for just doing a list saying, hey, it's just a list. I spend two hours at least every day going through every name available that I can find on the internet, whether it's at GoDaddy, 4.cn, the forums, it doesn't matter where it is and I'm always looking for something that I think is going for less than I can resell it for tomorrow. It could be $50, it could be 1000 it doesn't really matter as long as I think I can make some profit. I, I'm not looking to make 400% in one day. If I buy something for 4000 and then after commission or after sale I make $4,500, i am doing it. It's $500 for a day's worth of work. I'm not going to write a post on how I make 400%, but I'm going to take the $500 right. and be done with it. And that's that's how I operate. I'm not trying to make a killing. I'm trying to make money. Yeah. You're all about flow. You want to just keep those domains moving and keep making money. It's just like those gloves on the on the shelf right there. It's not like you're charging, you know, you buy them for two and you sell them for 20 bucks, although you might. Wait a second. But yeah, it's just the flow of those. The more you can that's sell a of great, those. Those gloves are a great story. So so we had these gloves and we were on, you know, I have employees that are, are on margin. They want to know, I want them to have a certain margin. Mm -hmm. But so I buy the gloves for, uh, you know, I was paying $3, let's say, and all of a sudden I buy them for a dollar. And they changed the price to two ninety nine because that's the margin that we're getting. Well, when it's all said and done, I sold twice as many gloves, but I made less money because they were worried about margin rather than profit dollars. Mm -hmm. How much money did we make? And so I said, yes, we sold more gloves. Yes, I bought them better, but we made less money because you're concentrating on margin instead of profits, and we right. operate through profit. You pay the bills with profits. <laughs> so that's, that's gloves are a perfect example. I teach my people, we, yes, we want to meet a certain margin, but if you can get more, you get more. You, you want to get as much as you can out of it. You shouldn't be happy with $500, you want to try and get more, but if you made money in the end, then you can move on to the next day. Exactly. So it takes money to make money. Do you have a certain amount of money that you keep liquid, sort of devoted to buying new domain names or from selling domain names? You keep it in sort of a certain kitty that your wife doesn't like know about? Well, she doesn't. <laughs> this money stays there. Every And I like to point this out to people that are that don't have any money and getting into it. When I started, I started with absolutely zero dollars. I've never invested one penny 
of any outside money in this, what I do, not one penny. It's all started with either writing a blog or having a site or parking or something, but I never invested. I didn't buy a domain name until I sold some advertising on a website I did. So I do, and it does take money to make money, and that's where this snowball effect, that's where the six figures are coming in because I am not putting outside money. I had to create a bankroll to do it, but once you have the bankroll, then you can buy something for 10000 and sell it for eleven, or buy it for two and sell it for five. And once you get to that, life gets a little more complicated, but it's easier to make money. So now I try and keep twenty-five to $30,000 in cash at all points in time so that I can jump on something. But that wasn't true last year. Last year it was ten. The year before it was five. The year before it was 1000 Every year it just bankrolls a little bit more. And so it, it just it's just zeros at the end, yeah. but it's the same concept. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your sweet spot? What's the what's the domain amount that really is like, yeah, that I want I'll buy a domain name if I think it's valued at that amount, but if it were 10 times that amount, I I might not buy it. What's your sweet yeah, spot? Yeah. I think the selling sweet spot that we're seeing in the industry tends to be in that 2500 to 4000 range. Mm -hmm. So if I can buy I, I do quite a bit where I buy 500 to 1500 and then sell for I sell a lot of my five letter dot coms for apps, for websites or apps. And that twenty five hundred dollars three thousand seems to be the number they don't want to cross. Yeah. Doesn't mean you can't get more. I see other people doing it all the time. But um, generally I can pick up the names from a hundred to fifteen hundred and sell them in those range. Great. Okay, so we had a small little lag right there. I understand that you're looking to buy in the five hundred to fifteen hundred range typically, and then you're looking to sell them in the to uh, twenty five hundred to four thousand dollar range, and that's sort of the sweet spot that you see a lot of sales happening. Even though uh, you and I both see a lot more sales happening in higher ranges, and I don't know how they do it, but I'm going to get them on to talk about how they do it also. But yeah. you're seeing that that's a sweet spot now for those twenty five hundred to four thousand price tagged domain names that you're selling. Where do you get the most activity? It's actually inquiries, whether it's through the uh, parking company that I'm using, which I use a lot on internet traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, I get I get requests through that, and I get a lot of who is emails that ask the price. And I will say, of the emails that I get, they reach out and look for them. It's I actually get a high percentage of people that are truly interested. I don't seem to get a lot of junk when it comes to those type of emails. I have I have pretty good luck with those. So most people know that I don't do a lot of domain investing, but I do have, uh, you know, my areas and I do get a, a fair amount, a, a low amount of inquiries that come in on some of the domain names that I own. And I use internet. I've tried internettraffic.com recently because I wasn't monetizing any of my domain names. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And most of the inquiries that come in for me are two, three hundred dollars. Sometimes it's like twenty dollars. <laughs> Even yeah, though I have a minimum set, like I don't get people yeah. coming to me and saying, "Hey, how about two thousand dollars for the domain name?" No, and that's that's probably a numbers game. You know, you're seeing if you had if you had five thousand names, you'd probably get more. If you have a couple hundred names, it's again, it's percentages. So your percentages probably aren't that different than other people. Yeah. I've noticed with more names I get. But on internet traffic, I used to get a lot more, but I, I have to say I haven't gotten quite as many lately as I used to, and they're coming outside of that. So I, but it's still probably 70% through internet traffic, but it's, it's not nearly as much. But it doesn't take a lot of sales to, to pay for everything. You just need one or two good ones a month to, to help make some good money. Yeah. No, that's you a have good, good names, though. I mean, that's, again, that's a whole other show. I know. Have, not, how many domains you have has nothing to do with how much money you're making. I know guys with so many domains, and you, I wouldn't pay for any of them. Doesn't mean they're not going to sell some, but I wouldn't buy them. Yeah. So you're using internettraffic.com, which anybody can sign up for now, and they can um, uh, part their domains there, and, and uh, uh, Frank Schilling's uh, service will put ads, but they'll also put a banner at the top that says, inquire about buying this domain and people can then click through to internet traffic and they fill out their information and they can submit a, um, a bid on it and you can set minimums like I don't want to accept any bids under thousand sure. dollars for example. So that's one way that you're using where end users come to you but I know you use a lot of other platforms. You already mentioned 4.cn that you use to sell your numerics. Um, 
And I've seen on your blog, I believe, that you use Namejet.com to sell yeah. domains as well. Yeah, I was real fortunate. And this is a, one of the reasons you go to, to domain conferences. As uh, I went, oh, it's been three years, and a group of us, uh, Oscar Carrera and uh, and another person who probably doesn't want me to name him, so I won't. But we were sitting at a table, and we met with one of the founders, Steve, of Namejet, and, and basically discussed. I'm looking for outlets. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't run a business if you don't have sales. Right. And in the industry, I heard everybody buying names and I heard people doing private sales, but I needed a platform to help me sell. And GoDaddy really at that time wasn't doing a good job with it. Nobody was. And uh, Namejet said, if, you're, if you can send me some quality names, we can put them in the mix. And, uh, and you're seeing lots of, you're seeing this a little more open now. That's why I can talk about it. If you have quality names, it's a great platform to go through. Mine were the quality you're seeing maybe over the last couple of weeks, but they were saleable and they, and I probably have a 70% to 80% sales rate when I put them up at Namejet, which says, says a lot. It's not huge numbers. Yeah. Namejet is not going to. That shows that there's enough interest in those domain names for people to bid on them. So anybody exactly. that wants to figure out how the Namejet.com platform works, they can go watch the Matt Overman uh, interview that we did with the general manager of Namejet where he talks about how it works and uh, how you submit your names because anybody can submit names. Just make sure that they're good names. Yeah. Um, so for yours, Shane, and I have also seen I, I get the daily emails from Namejet saying, hey, these domains are coming up for auction if you want to put in a bid. And a lot of them are private sales. And you know it's a private sale because, well, it, because it's got a reserve. It's got a little round yeah. R and a blue circle next to it when you go to it saying it's a reserve um, bid. So but We the, also put out a lot of names with no reserves. And there That's, are a lot with no reserves. There are a lot of private ones mixed in there. So um, which way do you do it, Shane? I, If I... If I'm 100% positive that it will sell and I will get my money back or get good money, I'll go ahead and put no reserve because I don't want to say the word hide, but it kind of gets in the mix a little better. Uh, once you put a reserve on it, people know that it's private. And I don't think that makes any difference. A name is a name. If it's good, it's good. You're going to buy it. If it's not, it's not. I don't get caught up in the who's selling it. I don't care who's selling it. Yeah, I'm really interested in the name. But I do put reserves on quite a bit. And yeah. uh, Namejet will have periods where they don't want you to have reserves. Mm -hmm. They want, uh, and that hasn't been lately, but there are periods where people say, oh, there weren't as many. Well, there are they want other names to flow through there. So there are there are periods that uh, you don't have a choice. But in general, you, you can put a reserve on it. If it's too high, Matt, Matt's the nicest guy, one of the nicest guys in this industry. Absolutely fantastic guy. He probably works harder than me. He is a hardworking man. and um, But he will say, hey, knock that reserve down. Nobody's going to pay $20,000 for a shizzle. <laughs> you know? So it's it's a great communication. It's a great platform. I've enjoyed working. Matt took over for Steve, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And it gives me an out, gives me another place to sell names, and that's what I do for a living. I sell right. names. Well, and, and everybody's so I, got their own marketplace out there where you know they have their portfolio of a hundred thousand names or thirty thousand names, so they create their own marketplace. But then they've got to drive people there. Namejet has a lot of bidders, a yeah. lot of domain name investors that show up every day looking for opportunities. So it's, yeah, it's already and, built in. And that's where my list comes in. It's, it helps drive people to Namejet. You know, Namejet used to have the affiliate program. Right. I was definitely one of the top earners on that program, but it got, it, he was a little generous in his, in his uh, affiliate money. So I think it probably took a little toll on them, but I do drive it. I drive it because I think there's good names. I'm already looking through the list people benefit from it yep. and i'm not gonna lie if i have a name on there i can put it on my list and that means more people get to view it so sure it's, it, it's just name jet is my sales domain chain is my marketing tool yep. and it all just plays together it works out real well for me do you find that most of your 2012 sales came from not the affiliate income that you made from name jet but the sales did you make most of your sales through name jet in 2012 I would say, I can break it down pretty simply, 30% uh, of my sales came from my, or my revenue came from my blog and, and what my blog generates. Not much advertising, not a lot of people advertise, I am thankful for the ones that do. Uh, Escrow.com pretty much keeps me running, but there are, um, but the other ones come from uh, affiliate money that comes through the blog, so 30% that. Namejet probably provided 30% of the other sales or income. 
and then the rest were private sales. A lot of private, so 40% private, wow. Yeah, there's, and they, yeah, they added up. It, you know, it doesn't seem like there's a lot, but when you, again, when you do the taxes, <laughs> you start looking at either the PayPal or the escrow or the wire transfers, and you thought, you start thinking, God, you know, because, you know, when you do the taxes, you get your, you get your, uh, you know, 1099s, and you get all these forms, but the private ones, you don't get those. Right. Go through, and you don't, it, it really adds up pretty quick. Yeah, so, it's amazing. So your money's sitting in the bank when you're done. <laughs> so for anyone that thinks that working full-time and domain name investing on the side uh, doesn't take enough time in your daily schedule, you're also a long-distance runner. Isn't that correct? Yeah, I, uh, I do marathons and Ironman. That's my side gig. And anybody that does a marathon or an Ironman or has done one in the past knows how much training time goes in. It's not as bad as like the bicyclists that go and trade for, train for the century or ultras or anything like that. But it still takes a lot of time to go out and run 20 miles. Yeah, yeah I mean, I run 10 miles a day. Uh, during Ironman, I, it's 17 hours a week is what it takes. And, you know, I, I, I watch Shark Tank all the time. And Mark Cuban told a guy the other day, you know, that I was watching a show the other day, he said, I would never invest in a man that does Iron Man because he puts in so much time into that <laughs> that he's not putting enough time into his job. And I, and I still think about that every single day when I'm running. Am I wasting my time? But the difference between the man he was talking about and me is I get up at four and I'm done at 630. Probably wouldn't have been working there. Uh, maybe I could have or maybe I should have, but it's my time. It makes me a stronger human being. It makes my blood flow. It makes clears my brain. It makes me healthy so I can work longer. You know, it, it takes a lot to work 100 hours a week physically. Yeah. So uh, training actually helps me go a little better. And, uh, yeah, it's part of what I do. It keeps – I can eat – I've been eating bars and Pop-Tarts all day. I can eat whatever <laughs> I want. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm mid forties and I feel like I'm in really good shape. You know, I did, yeah. I did my Ironman in 13 hours, 13 hours of anything is exhausting. Yeah. It's just exhausting. So that's I, crazy. I, I'm happy with, it. I'm proud of myself. I mean, I really yeah, do. Yeah, that's amazing. So you get up at 4 a.m. Do you, fir do you work out first thing in the morning or do you go to work yes. first? So I, I get up at four and then I drive and I meet other guys and we run from five to six thirty. I come home with my family and we have breakfast and talk a little bit and then I head out to work. I get to work at seven thirty and then I generally come home from work about eight and then spend a little time with my family while I do my blog. I work on the blog from about eight to nine thirty or ten. And, uh, and then I go to bed and do it all over again. And of course I take time out, you know, tomorrow, I'm going to a track meet tomorrow afternoon. So, you know, family comes yeah. before everything, but obviously there are some sacrifices. I don't watch very much television. I don't, I don't play video games anymore. I just, all I do is work and blog. So that's amazing that you've got that kind of dedication in your schedule and you're busy for so many hours a day. Do you, do you ever just get burned out? Do you feel like, I need a vacation, I need to get out of here? Or are you just like pumped uh, up, like the running keeps you going and you love interacting with people? Like you're clearly a people person. Yeah, it, you can ask my wife. I think she'll tell you that I do get tired. My eyes get really tired. It's a funny thing is you can see it in my eyes when, they, when I really start getting tired. And, and when I work... Every single day for about six or eight weeks, yeah. there comes a burnout. I, I I will have to say I've had a hospital stay from exhaustion hmm. uh, more than one time, two times. My doctor, or I have a very good, I run with all doctors. I have five physicians. <laughs> well, that's so, convenient. <laughs> very convenient. But I think uh, all in all, it works out pretty well. But there are limits. And, and yes, vacation. And there is an end game. There's, I'm not going to work this hard forever, but yeah. I'm at the I'm at the pinnacle of my life. Mid 40s is a fantastic time. You have your health, you have your money. Hopefully, you have children and a wife. It's just a perfect time. And so, yep. yeah, I'm I'm absolutely enjoying this to the fullest. But there are there are days and times where you just uh, you got to take time off and do nothing. Yeah, definitely. And so one of those times, you actually broke away from the business and you came down to Santa Monica, California. We met at WebFest Global Conference this past yeah. February. You weren't planning on going. Then find, then you changed your mind last minute and you went down there. I was looking forward to going running with you and then you backed out on me. 
Yeah, but we talked about it at like 2.30 <laughs> in the morning. You said, hey, you want to go out at 6? And I said, that's in a couple hours, Mike. Dude, that's more sleep than you get most nights at home. Come on. I don't get any sleep that co- – I love the conferences, I, but the <laughs> sleep is, is just non-existent. Running and conferences do not go together. It's – yeah, it's definitely – what. who else was going to go out with us? Paul uh, Nix. Paul Nix, he, he backed out also. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm in for the first day, Mike. Catch me <laughs> yeah. on the first day. Yeah, we're, we're definitely not runners at that point in time. There's other <laughs> things to be had during that point in time, <laughs> but in mileage is not one definitely. of them. Uh, so I thought you were afraid to run with me because of my 258 marathon. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's what I heard, but I was trying to figure out if it was one of those political marathons where you figure out later it's really four hours. It's all downhill. Yeah, exactly. I got to ride in a bicycle part of the yeah. time. Yeah, I, I figured I, I, I need to do my homework and see if I can find that time. <laughs> I've got one in two weeks. I'm trying to break 315 wow. again. Yeah, uh, two weeks from today or yesterday, actually. Nice. Well, you're om- you're almost ready for that taper. That's the best time of uh, training for a marathon, where you get to run <laughs> less and sleep more. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So many people only look at their domain name por- portfolio, Shane, as dollars and cents. They could care nothing about the domains. Um, they just want to acquire them low, sell them high. But you make more use out of your domain names. You actually use some of them for fun. I read a post on your blog recently about an April Fool's prank. It busted me up. Can you tell me that story? Yeah, I mean, the, the great thing about domain names is uh, you can assign emails to any of them. At any point in time, you can you can have one. And, and so I use a time to kind of play with people. And one of them I have is champagneil.org, which uh-huh. sounds like our town's email. Sure. So I emailed uh, for April Fool's, I emailed a friend. We had gone running and he, he kind of had a little stomach issue in the middle of the run. So he had to go to the park and it was way, real early. And he came out, let's just say he came out with one less glove. <laughs> and so my friends and I were laughing about it. They wanted to send a letter, and I said, oh, that's archaic. I'm a domain guy. Let me come up with something. So I got legal at champagneillinois.org, and we sent him a ticket for defecating and urination in a park, and it worked great. He well, and I got to say, it wasn't one of those, like, spammy emails that you get that has spelling errors and punctuation errors, and you're like, this is just BS. Like, this would, this looked like a legitimate email. Oh, you can go to domainshane.com and read it. Yeah, time writing it and, and I've done it in the past I've used that email address and done taxes at Champaign Illinois and sent it to my friend saying he hadn't paid uh, r- uh, real estate tax in two years <laughs> and that he was in big trouble and I knew that it would work because it just looks so official and if they respond I can respond right back and yeah. saying oh I show right so it's it, it's a lot of fun and, well, I, and it's hilarious. You, had a, a, you had a reference license number down there yeah. and you ended up yeah, using it was, um, we, yours it planned out. it was definitely planned out we took his yeah, we had all. The only thing I had was the date was a little off. It was off a day. It was a, I put Saturday or Sunday instead of the right day. But he did not figure it out. And and until he made the phone call to one of our friends, all he could he told me all he could think about is how was he going to explain this to his wife when it went into the paper. <laughs> it was great. A good use of domains. Dollars well spent. Yeah, definitely. That would definitely make it worthwhile. Uh, and we've all been in that situation. It's unfortunate when it happens. Yeah, All right, yeah. Shane. So I usually like to wrap up with one final question. I feel like there's so much more in your domain name repertoire that I haven't asked you about, but we're coming up on the one hour mark. If you had um, one other tip that you'd provide to somebody that's relatively new in the domain name industry that maybe has a couple of thousands of dollars to, to devote to buying good names or is looking for an area or, or a platform to focus on, what would you recommend that they focus on to start investing? Well, the first thing I would say is you need to know the value of domains. And that's obviously a very difficult thing. But sales are... So if GoDaddy and Namejet have sales and there were 50 bidders and 100 bidders and 60 bidders, that means that multiple people are interested and that's probably a good value of that domain. So you want to be buying domains that have that kind of interest. And find domains that have that kind of interest, but they maybe only go for 300 or 400. But realistically, if you were to buy that and put it back on Namejet, you're probably going to attract the same amount of bidders, and you have a chance that maybe somebody else missed it and will step up to the plate. So you want to buy domains that have interest. Just because you're interested in it doesn't mean others will. And and I I, I met with her. I talked with a guy that put. 
200 domains on Namejet and one sold. Now, he's a good domainer, and his names weren't that bad, but it tells you a lot about your portfolio. And you have to ask yourself, if I took this portfolio and put it on Namejet, would it sell? Yes, you could possibly sell it for more. Yes, possibly someone could offer you 20000 for one of those names. But when it's all said and done, you have to have a portfolio that has some interest. And that's what I would say is build a portfolio of names that other people would buy, not just one guy that runs an event you know, an event in Albuquerque, so you have Albuquerque Events, Inc. You need it that a lot of people would use. The more people that could use that name or show interest in the name, the more value it is. And it doesn't have to be a category killer. It just needs to be some kind of term. And, and so that's where you should start. It doesn't have to be a lot of money, but it has to be some. And reg is a tough game. So that's, Great that's how I that say feeds okay. right into your 3L, 4L domain names that, you know, companies are looking for their company acronym because it's a three word company name. Yeah. There are hundreds, if not thousands of companies like that around the world. Absolutely. And if, if a period of time you don't sell it, guess what? You put it back up for sale in an auction and you get your money back. I'm all, all for getting my money back on some. I need cash. If I find, I'll find another name that works or I could sell. So I, I do, and I have no problem putting it back up on Namejet and getting my money back or even losing a little because I just want to win more than I lose in this. And then there's a whole other you know, set of names that I'm waiting. I bought, uh, I bought Dowo, D-O-W-O. -O. I'm very into CVCV. -CV. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to put that back. I'm waiting for someone that really wants that name. So there's a section of names I'm more than willing to wait for, mm -hmm. but, but I, I need money to buy more names. I'm not just going to keep putting money into the kitty. I need to make money to make more money. So that's the kind of names that, that people should be looking for. This isn't a buy and hold industry. This isn't, it is a buy. No, you, not. You, can't, you can't buy and hold forever. It's some, we're not Michael Birkins and Rick. Most of us do not have that quality portfolio. Right. The most up and coming guy in this is Andrew Rosner. I love Andrew. Andrew's got it down. Buying and selling or buying and selling other people's names. And he's doing, he's hitting it out of the park. Mm -hmm. He's, to me, he's the guy that people should be following. Yeah. Rick is great. All those people that I mentioned people but the reality of it unless you come in with cash it's you're going to build it more like andrews built it than you're going to build it like rick that's just how it is nothing against either one of those but that's how you're going to you're going to build it you're not gonna you're, you're just not going to have those portfolios on your own definitely and so those 3l 4l short domains the double l dot orgs do you find it, it, and so clearly you need to know the value of it so you know if you're getting a good deal buying and if it's worth it to sell it you know, clearly you, you gave some great definitions. If you're getting, you know, 60, 70, 80 people bidding on it and you can get it for 300 or 400, that's a good deal because then you can turn around. It's like a really sweet spot at a low yeah. dollar amount. But how do you know how much it's worth? Do you use tools like Estabot.com to figure out the valuation? Is it good for valuing 3Ls, 4Ls? I use I use Estabot and Name Bio. I like I like Adam. Adam's kind of came first, so uh, Adam Strong's Name Bio is kind of where I started using, and I still use Estabot. Has built a good tool mm -hmm. using the same realm. Yep. Um, I have I just happen to use I use Estabot for other things, but I and I love it as well. But I use Name Bio. I look at the history. Uh, I do like. I, of course, you want to see what it sold for before. Sure. And everybody feels good if you bought a name that sold for four thousand five years ago, and you bought it for two thousand. You think, hey, either I got a great deal or something's going on here. But yeah, you got to know your history. This is this is business. You have to know what things are worth, and that's just another tool to find out. Yeah, absolutely. So name bio, you would go and you type in the abc.com to see if it sold in the past, and if so, that sure. gives you a good idea of uh, or anything similar. Yeah, absolutely. Or or similar names, but then Estebot. You know, a lot of people will say, "Oh, Estebot." I looked up dating.com and it said it was worth five hundred thousand, not five million. And you know, they'll throw out these extreme values. But on the triple L dot, uh, dot coms or the four L dot coms, do you find that that it's in the realm that it's uh, a good estimate of the valuation of the yeah, domain name? I I think everybody likes a guide. It's like when we were kids and trading baseball cards. Yep. Uh, that became you got a, your book, it, right? Your yeah, book it became an exact, and I thought, why is Beckett making the exact? 
And so I use it as a reference, and, and Estabot yeah. is the same way. It's, it's a great reference. You, yeah. It gives you all kinds of data, and it gives you a reference, but I don't look into more than, more than that. Now, if it's the opposite way and it says it's worth 300 well, I better feel pretty confident that there's something that they're missing, but when it goes to 116 I don't think it's worth 116 I, I know what it's worth when I bought it, and it's right. probably somewhere in between. I'm hoping it's in between what I bought it for and what they're telling me it is. <laughs> So. Exactly. All right. If you have any other questions for Shane, please post them in the comments below the video and we'll ask Shane to come back and answer as many as he can while he's on break at the nursery or, you know, after he's a, his family has gone to bed, if we can get him to stay up late. Uh, you can follow Shane and his domaining activities on Twitter at Domain Shane. Uh, and if you're in Illinois, you need to stop by and see Shane at the nursery and say hi. Absolutely. I can answer plant questions too. I, I like at night talking about domaining, but hey, if you, as long as you think I know something and want to ask a question, I'm here. So. Why are my boxwoods dying? I've heard this thing, this, uh, this uh, saying uh, that like boxwood disease and nobody can explain it. They just die. No, box, a boxwood blight. Blight. Is what, it, what is that? Yeah. Uh, it's, just, it's a fungus that gets on boxwoods that don't have good air movement. So, yeah. And again, we, we talk forever, but information is key. There, there's a website for you, boxwood.com, and it showed all the information. You look it up, and you click an ad on it on how to buy some fungus. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, boxwood blight. I, and you can go look like, at Adam Strong's picture of his fungus on there also. It, it is so funny. To watch my emails is so comical because there's plant questions, domain questions, land questions. It's just, there's so much going on, and I have to be careful what I respond with. Sometimes you'll see... A plant question responded with, you know, domain Shane at gmail.com. <laughs> oh, wrong one, wrong one. <laughs> All right. Shane Cultra, owner of domainshane.com. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank hey, you for taking pleasure. time Thank out you of time. your busy schedule, sharing your story, your strategy, your tactics, and thanks for being a domain Sherpa. Oh, anytime. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time.